There we go. All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show and then post it on our website and our archives for you to watch um, later at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our recordings. Uh, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share. Uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in anything we have on Encompass Live. Um, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, so similar to your state library possibly. Um, so we provide services and training and resources to all types of libraries in the state, so you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, uh, historical societies, uh, really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. We do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes come on the show and do presentations about programming and things we're doing through the commission, but we also bring in guest speakers and that's what we have this morning. Uh, today we are going, well, we, Emily's going to talk about <laughs> accessibility, um, not just for patrons, but also for us working in our library. So I will hand it over to you, Emily, to uh, introduce yourself and take it away. Awesome. So yeah, my name is Emily uh, Gaywicki. I'm with the University of Nebraska uh, Libraries. I do tech services, and we're going to talk about accessibility. Uh, a lot of us have probably done posters or flyers or podcasts about books for our patrons. And so we're familiar with those public service ADA requirements. But when we're sending an email or a workflow or just a memo between colleagues, we might not put in all of that effort. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about why that's important, how it's different from doing it for the public, and then a couple of those major things. I have a lot about alt text. Uh, mm -hmm. captioning and subtitles, navigation, and then some more advanced things towards the end. So great. we'll take a start about defining disability. There's two major models. We have the medical model and we have the social model. Uh, medical is a physical or mental condition causes disability. And the social model is that inaccessibility causes disability. And as we're going through today, I'm taking a social model look at things that if we make things accessible, people won't have a non-ability to do things. They won't have a disability to access our ability mm -hmm. products. Um, the World Health Organization, they estimate about 15% of the population has some variation of a disability. Hmm. The US Census puts that rate at almost 30%. So three and ten kind of low to, it felt kind of low to me. <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's a lot, um, but we also had a recent major pandemic that is going to have disability effects. So that thirty percent, I think, is about a five or six year old statistic because it's the census and it takes a little bit. Um, but that number is probably going to go up at least a little bit within the coming years um, as disability from the pandemic goes. Uh, disabilities involve lots of things. We have those physical ones that we can see, but there's also cognitive ones like brain injuries or brain fog um, and hearing disabilities that we need to accommodate for in our coworkers. Um, accessibility and universal design, we hear that all the time in libraries. Uh, people need to be able to access things no matter who they are, their age, size, ability, disability, all sorts of things. Um, accommodation is a, an adjustment to a work or job uh, compared to how things are usually done. An accommodation is a legal requirement, uh, and they're covered by ADA. If someone has that paperwork, you have to do it. We're going to talk a bit more about voluntary accessibility and why we should be doing it, even if there is no accommodation paperwork. 
um, why do we do this? You're either disabled or you might be in the future. Ah, temporary disabilities can be things like a migraine, uh, surgeries, pregnancy, all sorts of things like that. And people also frequently will develop a disability as they age. Glasses is a major one that you'll see, as is hearing loss. Um, and if we aim for it now, our coworkers won't have to tell us when they have a migraine or when their vision's getting a little blurry. It's already there, already taken care of. Um, these accessible items, they can also stand without you there. Uh, if you're out for the week on vacation or uh, just aren't in the office one day, someone can still take that work form, that internal document, and make pretty decent sense of it without having to ask you a question because you made it as clear and accessible as possible. How it's different from the public, outside of accommodations, there's almost no legal requirement to do it. It's voluntary. Uh, for many people, it's a hidden need. They're not going to ask a coworker. They're just going to struggle through or make the changes on their own. And we're doing this more for interpersonal and work community development than for the benefit of all of society. Uh, showing our coworker, hey, I did this not because I have to, but because I care about making your life easier, even if you don't need to ask me. <coughs> so the first thing is alt text. Uh, we've heard about this a little bit. You see it in videos or major ADA things. And it's gonna be the major thing that you're gonna work with internal documentation. Uh, we're gonna write memos or emails, things that might have images and graphics. So this is gonna be a big part. Uh, alt text as just a general definition is a hidden description of a visual element. Uh, you can't just look at the page and see it. It's usable by like a screen reader. Um, can be used by those with a limited vision capabilities, including blind. Uh, and in certain ways, it can be used if you have a weak internet. It can be put up instead of an image to lower download necessity. Uh, and just the bare bone rules of how to make it. Don't put something like image of in your alt text. When a screen reader is going through a text and it hits an image with alt text, it will say image, and then it begins reading the alt text. So if it says image, image of, image, picture of, or however, it's duplicative and not necessary. Uh, next thing, keep it very brief. You get one, two sentences. A lot of alt text is also a maximum of 100 characters. So we're not putting in three, four paragraphs here. Ah, be mindful of the context. The alt text for your boss might be a bit different than the alt text for your coworkers. It might not be, it could be but kind of keep that in mind as you're making it. And then say you've got just a pretty clip art or like a filigree somewhere on your page that doesn't add anything to the text or the document. There are ways you can just mark it as decorative so that the screen reader skips right over it and you don't have to put like a smiley face as a description. So um, here are some examples of bad alt text I found. Um, I have come across using screenwriters before. Um, on the screen here, we have some pretty roses, and I have seen the alt text for those roses to be random numbers. And if you're using text to speech, you can't fast forward very easily. So all of a sudden, you come across image, and then it's slowly reading out all of these numbers or trying to turn them into like billion, million. It's really annoying and doesn't do anything and can be jarring to processing the documents. Same with the word plant or the date. And I've even seen an alt text that was automatic that was just the copyright information. And when you're talking about how to catalog a book in a document for a coworker, a copyright statement in the middle of the 
text is not useful or helpful. Um, so we'll go into some like better examples. Um, I chose some non-library examples just to kind of give an extreme way to show context. Um, so Grandiflora rosa blooms is what kind of flowers these are. A botanist, that would make sense to them. If you're just talking to hobby gardeners, a different context, a collection of pink Queen Elizabeth roses would be great. And kids, pink roses in a bush. Um, it gets the point across, it's accurate, um, and it takes into account who we're speaking to and what they want to know from the picture. Now, in internal documentation, we're never working, well, rarely going to be working with a pretty picture of flowers. We're going to be working with flow charts, hierarchies, pie charts, all sorts of really complicated pictures or images that need a lot of description, things that won't fit into one or two sentences, that won't fit in 100 characters. Um, so how do we handle that part? Complex images. So the first step is going to be that same traditional alt text. Um, just aim for something basic. If you have a picture in your workflow of some buttons on a website and they're labeled A, B, C, et cetera, a good alt text for that would just be an array of buttons with labels. And then beyond the alt text, we add an alternative description. Um, text and description can be synonyms. Here they mean different things. Text, very short, description, very long. Uh, three, there are three major options of how to do alternative descriptions. Um, the first is to do a caption uh, underneath your image that has maybe the statistics you're looking at or more information, because you can do several sentences as part of a caption. Another option, and my personal favorite, what I tend to do, is I discuss the image and the body of the text. So if I'm referencing button A, instead of just saying button A in the text, I will say button A, a blue or a small blue button towards the top of the page labeled submit, and then go on with my description so that they can tell where it would be in the image, but I'm discussing as part of the text. And the third option is for remarkably complex images, hierarchies that are made like massive, flow charts that have tons of subsets, uh, is to just link to a completely different page, a different Word document or a different website. After your image, you can put something that says link to alternative description as a hyperlink, go to a new page and describe it in as deep of detail as you would like. It could be three pages, as long as it gets the information across and correctly. Uh, when we're building that alt text, the major thing we're looking for is the idea or the conclusion makes sense and is discernible. Uh, we also want to look for alternative ways to communicate data. If we're doing a pie chart, we could pair it with like a data table that might be easier for a screen reader to handle. And we're looking to communicate the information of the image over what it looks like. So if we're doing a bar chart, we don't need to say category A is a red hash marked tower halfway up the image. It can be category A is 50% or however you're doing that data. Um, I have a resource for the guides. Uh, it's called Complex Images for All Learners by Supanda Amornja. They are from Western Illinois University, I believe, and they wrote a handbook on so many different types of complex images. And they have a little section for each one of how can we turn this into a text description? How can we do a list, a data table, and even how to turn our complex images into tactile or braille 
images so that they're still usable even without technology. Um, so I have a link to that at the end that will help get to that real quick. Um, so we're just going to go on to how to do alt text physically. Um, when you're trying to add or edit alt text, Microsoft Word and Suite are pretty easy. You can do a right click or a secondary click, whatever your mouse is set up to do. Um, and then click view alt text. It'll pop up on the side of your screen and you can change it. Microsoft Word does auto generate alt text for good or bad. Um, but you really want to make sure you go in and edit it just because their AI is not great. Google Docs is the same concept, right or secondary click, and then choose the option alt text. But if you just use a keyboard, if the images is selected, you can just hit control or alt and Y, and it will open it as well. As I just mentioned, though, a lot of programs are starting to use artificial intelligence and AI to auto-generate alt text for images. And this is a great first start to making things automatically accessible. But AI isn't that smart sometimes. So it's just going to say the most basic thing, or it's going to guess completely wrong on what an image is. With those pictures of flowers that I had earlier, it said flower as the alt text instead of anything more interesting or more descriptive. Mm. So while it is a great start, I would advocate that you try to avoid it. Um, you go in and you edit yourself, you add yourself. Um, but if you do use it, just make sure you proofread it. Uh, Microsoft adds a phrase at the end of their alt text that they generate saying it was generated with X amount of confidence, which is unnecessary information for the user or your coworker or whomever to read. So that is- I've seen, I've seen that coming up in my um, Facebook posts. I've been doing a lot of posting images of things um, for conferences and events and, and like for promoting Encompass Live and whatnot. And, um, I noticed that why does it already have alt text? I didn't do it yet. Oh, it did it for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me double and it does do that image of, and I'm like, or might be a picture of, and I'm like, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> so yeah, it it, it, yeah, it it tries really hard, um, but it's just a start. AI is developing. We've seen it in the news so much recently. But it, when it comes to alt text, it's got a little bit to learn um <laughs> yes <laughs> we're getting there um but alt text that's a, a big basics for it next thing we can talk about is the auditory support uh not everyone can hear not everyone can understand um but videos and your voice recordings are not your only problem when we're talking about how to support audio um if you are telling someone or writing a document on how a machine like a printer might work and it makes a little ding when it's done doing whatever process, if you're deaf, you can hear the ding. So you wanna look when you're writing these workflows of what else you can tell someone to indicate that something has happened. Maybe with the ding, a little light turns on or a screen flashes or something that you can also add to support. Um, and when you're choosing how you want to make this support, you have to look at what you're communicating, uh, what technology your coworkers might have access to, and just decide overall what's important. Do they need to know that it dinged, or is that just kind of fancy? Um, so as I talked about a little bit with the ding and the light, that's a coexisting cue. So one thing happens and something else will happen and tell the exact same information. Um, it's a great option if we're talking about processes, machines, things of that nature. Uh, for typical audio support with voice, we have captioning. There are two major types that's open and closed. Uh, on the screen right now, my captioning is called open captioning because you can't turn it off. 
uh, closed captioning is what you would normally see on TV, Netflix, YouTube, where the user would have to say, yes, I would like to see captioning, please. Um, major thing with both of them, they need to be an exact match of what the, what is said. That includes saying um, and that includes profanity. Ah, you're not going to censor. The point of the caption is to let someone know exactly what was said, not do sentence and grammar repair after the fact. Ah, transcripts are another thing that you can use for presentations if someone had to miss a meeting or something. Um, they are a formatted and edited uh, transcript of what was said. And when I say edited, I mean adding things like punctuation, capitals, and fixing spelling, not taking out the um. Uh, they're very labor intensive, but they are very useful for people who need uh, some tools we have. I just said don't use AI. I'm going to flip on this one. AI is very useful for automatic transcription. Uh, my text at the bottom of the screen is automatic transcription using Microsoft AI, or I believe Microsoft AI. It's not 100% accurate, but it is better than not having anything. Um, it is great for major vocabulary, uh, normal conversation. If you have a fun name like GayWiki, it's not going to say the correct words, but it gets the idea across of the sound. <clears throat> For live presentation, that's what you can see here. PowerPoint does it, Google Slides does it, a mm, couple others probably do it. And if your software doesn't normally, Web Captioner is a free software online you can use. Uh, to caption things in real time using AI. But if you're just sending a video to your coworkers of how to do something, you can use that web captioner and it'll do the same thing. Um, as was stated at the beginning, YouTube adds captions automatically. They're not perfect, but once again, better than nothing. And if you have all the time in the world, have a little extra budget, or are really good at computers, you can make something called an SRT file. I believe it's sub rip transcript. Uh, and they are the file that you pair to a video that adds the subtitles into it. They are complex to write, but there are ways you can find online to at least make the framework for you. Or if you've got tons of time, you can hand write them in things like Notepad. And then you can upload them into YouTube or with your video and it will show on the bottom as correct and properly timed subtitles. Ah, that's a very over the top option, but it's good to know that those exist and how that works. Uh, next thing is navigation is a quick thing to do for your coworkers. Um, not everyone can use the trackpad or not everyone can use a mouse. So we want to aim to make sure that they can still get around our workflows, get around our documents. It also aids just in quick skim uh, skimming of our documents because it is a heading based system. And when we're setting it up, we can think of it kind of like bullet points made with text styles. Sounds very weird. But we start off with a heading one. Heading one, only used one, then two, three. You kind of see a diagram on the screen right now of what that could look like. Um, we don't skip from two to four, but uh, it can help. And then how to turn it on. Uh, it varies by the program you're using. Microsoft, it's a home tab ribbon style function. And you highlight these whatever heading you want to change. <clears throat> and then you apply that style. And then it will change how your words look. You can go back and change how it looks, and it'll keep that heading. 
style hidden, so it's still navigation. Google Docs is under the format tab. It's a paragraph style. They have a lot of heading options. I think they have up to heading number seven. So they're a great tool <clears throat> to make sure you have lots of options for navigation. And then I don't know how much internal documentation you might be making with HTML. Maybe you like HTML editors for writing things. Um, but, you know, heading start, break heading, uh, basic coding to get that to work. Um, so before we go on, I'm going to like, that was the basics. Does anyone have like a question about these three major topics before I go on some other things? Yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, type into the question section of your GoToWebinar interface. I'm monitoring that here and I can uh, read it off for you. Um, nothing came in while you were talking, Emily. So um, see if anybody, I can't see if you're typing. So just, uh, we give a minute or so here for me to see if anything pops up. <laughs> it was partially so I could get a drink of water without <laughs> yes, the yes. sentence. But... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't see anything right now. Um, I'll just keep an eye on it. If anybody does, I just type in your questions or comments or, oh, wait, of course, as soon as I say something. Thanks, Amy. Uh, <laughs> Amy wants to know. Um, Okay, and how, how okay, the question, and you could repeat this, Emily, then, so it gets into the closed captioning for you, too. How difficult is Microsoft AI to set up for closed captioning? Um, Microsoft AI to set up for closed captioning is very, very easy. Nice, okay. So when you uh, go into your PowerPoint and you hit present, uh, towards the bottom left side of your screen, um, you've got, I don't know if you can see them, but there's a bunch of little bubble options down here. Yes, we can see that on your screen, yes. Awesome, so there's this one that's right here and it will do subtitling. And you just hit that, it'll say, we're turning this on. You hit okay, and now you have captioning on your PowerPoint. It is very easy. Google Slides is about just as easy to turn on. You start mm -hmm. presenting and then there will be an option somewhere on your screen to just hit start transcribing. So very easy to start the AI Microsoft uh, captioning. And as you can see, when we're using, you're using PowerPoint within GoToWebinar, it adjusts and shows not just the slide, but the, you know, everything kind of shrinks up so that you can see that below. It's not cut off or anything. Yep, it makes it proportional, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so. Very easy, very, very useful. Awesome. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna see anything else right now. Uh, go on, go ahead, Emily. And if you do, anybody does have any questions, anything pops into your mind, just go ahead and type it in and I'll keep an eye on it. We do have thank you awesome. for that answer, yeah. Cool. So these next couple of things we're gonna talk about are not ADA things. These are nice things we can do to make our documents accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, that first thing is gonna be clarity of language. English is a really ridiculous language. Um, so we wanna try and avoid as much confusion as possible and use as much clear language as we can. Um, this can benefit uh, English second language speakers, uh, people from different backgrounds, England, Australia, and the US all have very different ways of speaking. Um, and it can also benefit people who have processing and cognitive disorders that can lead to issues understanding spoken language as well as issues understanding written text. Ah, so when we're making our workflows, we have a couple of things that we want to avoid to make things as clear as possible for as many people. Uh, first is undefined technical jargon or abbreviations. Ah, Next would be slang or idioms, because they don't translate well. Vagueness, saying exactly what we mean. And then we want to avoid doublespeak. Uh, doublespeak is saying one thing and meaning a different thing. A good example you will see is if someone says, hey, go put away these books, and they actually mean put away the books and shelf read and clean and all these things. 
just say exactly what you're trying to say. <clears throat> so I have some examples. Okay. There it goes. Uh, so for jargon or abbreviations, uh, the 245 needs to follow this format. If none of you catalog or have to work with MARC files very often, 245 is no logical thing. So we would rephrase it. We can still use that 245, but we can say the 245, the title field needs to follow this format because most everyone is going to understand what a title is. Everyone in a library is going to understand what the title is. Um, in terms of slang and idioms, the new project is a cakewalk. Making a cake is very difficult and cakes don't have legs. So why does it mean something is easy? I have no idea. I'm an adult, so I've memorized it. But when we're saying something is easy or difficult, using those adjectives that are part of the normal language, it's a lot easier than using an idiom that might not translate well. Uh, vagueness. Put the item with the others. If they knew where the other things were, you wouldn't need to tell them, nor would, would they ask you. So we can say specifically, put the item on the shelf with the blue tag. We've told them exactly what we mean. They don't have to ask a follow-up question and it's clear. And then an example of the double speak that I've encountered. Um, how did you find the material? And what they were actually asking is how did you learn about this material? These two questions will elicit different answers, um, depending on how literally you take the questions. So making sure that whatever sentence you put, question you ask, uh, things of that nature are going to elicit the correct type of information. If you want to know where they put something, ask them where they put it, not where did it go? things like that. It's That is probably going to be one of the hardest concepts for a lot of people to learn because English, once again, is a ridiculous language. And we can ask the same question in so many different ways, slightly different from each other. So it could take a lot of work to figure out that specifically. Uh, the next thing we can do did it change? There it goes. Um, is doing multiple formats for our word for our workflows, our internal documents. If you make a video, you could put a word document with it. If you do a word document, maybe make a checklist. Um, this allows people uh, to choose however they want to get their information. Uh, whatever works best for their brain, their body, or their situation. If you have a coworker who is going to be doing some work out in the public with you know, uh, individuals, a video training them on how to do it is a great option until they're out in the field and need a refresher on something. Then they can't put the video or they can't see the check or so a checklist will be better. Um, or they're in a really loud environment and they want to just read it. Having all of them together makes things just a little bit easier. And not everything has to be the same type of offerings, but try to keep it consistent. Uh, some examples of how that would look, um, how to catalog a book as like a training document. Uh, I have one that I wrote, it's about 20 pages. It's great if you've never done it before. If you're looking for just one piece of information, it is the most infuriating thing to go through. So to make it more accessible, I have quick checklists that's a couple pages and then a little short list that's like a sticky note long. That allows me to just hand it off to somebody who already knows kind of what's going on to be able to take over something for a day. Me to refresh or a full training document for someone brand new. 
Um, maybe we're teaching a coworker how to new, use a new piece of tech that we've got. Uh, video, great first option. Uh, but as I was just mentioning with doing field work, a video might not be loadable. So a Word document expressing very similar information uh, would be a good option. But for people who can't necessarily read large blocks of text, uh, video is the better option, giving them that choice between the two. <laughs> and the Word document also very similar to that transcript with the stills from videos. Um, and then presentations. We teach our coworkers in person all the time. In person, step number one, that's one format. Uh, we can also just distribute the slides. I'll have these posted after this so you guys can just go look at them. And then transcripts, same thing, so people can read it instead of listening to it. Uh, give people as many options as you can do that makes sense. <clears throat> ah, and then try to keep your offerings and your formats consistent. So don't make uh, this document like one font in this big way in this one unique formatting way. And then this other one is super basic. Try to keep them all looking similarly formatted uh, so people aren't having to change how they're reading every single time they switch. Uh, keep in mind the common tech. People aren't usually using overhead projectors nowadays, so you don't have to do that. Um, but people use a lot of cell phones nowadays. Uh, so if you're expecting someone to be able to access something on a small screen, make sure you keep that in mind when you're formatting. <clears throat> and then a big thing that you see a lot in accessibility is fonts. Uh, you'll hear talk about a serif font and a sans serif fonts, and which ones are better for dyslexia and better for paper and better for screens. Um, there are so many options for fonts. There are no truly wrong answers <clears throat> because every font says something a little different. But when you're looking for good accessible fonts, um, you've got three big principles. Imposters, making sure that things don't look like each other. Discernibility, meaning that if something gets blurry, it still looks unique. And mirroring, uh, so if something rotates or flips, it still looks like its own letter. And I have more examples. First one is not a font you probably want to use in an internal document. Ah. Uh, it's Broadway. That first section is a capital I and a lowercase l and the number one. And they look very similar to each other. So lots of imposters, hard to tell the difference. C and O are discernibility. If the C gets blurry, it's going to look like the O or if it gets too close to a different letter. And D, P, D, B, Q, and P. Those are all the same letter, just turned around. Um, I tested it. You can take a screenshot of those four letters and turn it all over the place, and it's still going to look like those letters, just in different spots now. Ah, so we want to avoid things like that where mirroring is really common. Uh, Bernana, Berdana, Berdana is my favorite font. It's what I have this presentation in. Uh, Imposter is really good. Discernibility is pretty decent. Uh, mirroring is good. Times New Roman, a really popular font, especially in academics. Uh, it's a serif font, so it's got the little feet and the little decorations on the ends of letters. <clears throat> uh, it's a pretty decent font, but there's a lot of talk about how a serif font might not be a good choice for dyslexia or for readability. Um, there's lots of research still going into this, so make your best educated guess on a day-to-day -day basis. There might be more research and more fonts coming out in the future. Um, but Calibri is what's replacing Times New Roman in a lot of places. Uh, 
all posters or the imposters, discernibility, mirroring, all good. Um, but for example, the State Department, the US State Department just changed their website from Times New Roman to Calibri for accessibility reasons. I think within the last month, so sometime January 2023. Um, and then I have my favorite chaos example. Um, this is what I write my personal documentation in. Uh, when I'm just writing it and haven't shared it yet, I do it in Comic Sans because it's the easiest for me to read. Uh, as you can see, there's no imposters. The discernibility is excellent. And there's no mirroring. I wouldn't say send an important memo to your boss no. in Comic Sans. But also, it's a really good font for readability um, and accessibility. But it's a good example of what you're looking for to apply the concepts to others. Mm. But I am advocating for chaos. It has a bad rap. It, it has a bad reputation. It really when, does. When it's it's in completely inappropriate, you know, settings. Yeah. Yeah. But if you have issues reading big box blocks of text, um, mm -hmm. try flipping the font to Comic Sans and it might be very useful to read a PDF in Comic Sans or not PDF, a Word document. It's interesting oh. you mentioned the State Department switch to Calibri because looking at your comparisons here, those first two letters, like the second one, it looks like one of those bar lines to me, not like mm -hmm. a letter. And I yeah. would prefer the Verdana, like you said, as a, over Calibri, but yeah. Yeah, that was an interesting choice, but I know Calibri, I think, is more widely accessible on more computers. I think Verdana uh -huh. might be limited to Windows or something like that. Uh -huh. um, but it's a little bit better than Times New Roman because L and one look identical in Times New Roman to me. Yes, definitely that. Yeah. Oh, um, so it when it comes to font, there's never going to be a perfect choice because every individual is a little bit different. Hence the word individual. Um, but Calibri is a little bit better than Times New Roman. So we're moving forward, maybe just not very far. Um. But I've got some like closing up things, just things to remember. The first thing is you're not perfect. This is new for you um, or could be new for you. So be willing to try something that you've not done before. If you've never, never used captioning on a PowerPoint, make that your very first step next time you do something for a coworker. <clears throat> try new things, try new processes in this. Uh, next is be open about learning. You're here, so great first step. First step. Uh, but accessibility progress goes really fast sometimes. Uh, people change fonts, new fonts come out. Uh, AI progresses really fast. So try to keep an eye on what's going on in the world. Accept the feedback you get. Every person is gonna have a little bit of thoughts on what you do. Uh, so if someone comes back and says, hey, bad font choice, or hey, can you make this a PDF instead of a Word document? Keep that in mind next time you go to do something and realize, hey, the technology or the environment or the preferences of my coworkers are these things. Let's do that when I make my internal documentation. And be comfortable remaking things. You probably have internal documentation that's been sitting around for maybe a couple weeks, maybe several dozen years. You might have to update it, maybe rewrite it, re-record it, add alt text to things. Going back and changing and updating is a good thing. This isn't something you can just start now and be better about. You can always go back and improve. And then remember that things are going to change. Uh, AI wasn't a huge thing in the public spotlight a couple of years ago. Uh, AI transcription on Microsoft slides came within the last year or so. 
Mm -hmm. uh, new ADA standards come about every couple of years. Web standards change. So don't get set in the mindset of what I've done here is perfect because in 10 years, you might need to change how you did it. Uh, and just keep that in mind, be flexible. Um, but that is, too, there it goes, the bulk of my information. Um, but I have here a little URL and a QR code for it as well that has a little site that has the slides for this, as well as a link for a bunch of different resources, including that handbook that I gave you, uh, the ADA standards and the federal standards, a book recommendation, um, and some other things like that that can help answer specific situational questions that I just can't address as many in a presentation. So now is a new time for questions, if anyone has them. Great. Um, yes, thank you, Emily. Um, yes, anybody does have any questions um, that you want to ask, definitely get them in. We still have about 10 minutes left in our time for today's show. Um, but we'll go as long as you all have questions. Um, we do have a question about the auto captioning. Um, okay. When auto captioning is turned on and recordings underway, do the systems have much difficulty with heavily accented speech? I would think that um, might make a difference. So if the system has issues with heavily accent or heavy accents, I have a Midwestern accent, so I've never tried it. Um, mm -hmm. And I haven't seen really anyone use it with mm -hmm. a heavy accent. So it would very much depend maybe on what the accent is. If it is like an English or an Australian accent that's very heavy, it might have an easier time mm -hmm. um, than like a French accent or a Japanese accent. Uh, the best option is to maybe go through and try a couple. Practice. See with the micro. Uh, but like see what Microsoft captions look like and try Google Slides and try web captioner and see what works best for the heavy accent you've got. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, practice it. I know I've attended some sessions where people where they have various types of auto captioning on. I'm not sure what program they're using sometimes. Uh, but it, it depends. I think something, if we're going to start using this, is like you've been talking today, and for some people it's difficult, uh, slowing down your speech just in general, mm -hmm. because if you talk very fast, it's not going to catch what you're saying. It might skip some words. I've seen that happen in presentations, or it will just have to guess and put in something that's completely, oh, that is not at all what the person just said, <laughs> because they've been yep. so, so fast, so, so fast. <laughs> It just doesn't, it can't catch it all. So you kind of have to practice. And I think that would help possibly with just anything in accent. Practice mm -hmm. speak slower, more clearly, more deliberately, so that the system can recognize whatever you're saying. Um, and like I said, practice oh. ahead of time. See what it does do when you say things. <laughs> yeah. And then also if you're talking about really complicated niche topics. Yeah. Uh, that could also be a big issue because it's working off of a, off of a vocabulary um, and matching what you say to that. If you are saying like a dinosaur name or something, it might not match. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind as well mm -hmm. and practice your actual topic with each captioning software to figure out what's gonna work best for you. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> All right. Um, does anybody have any other questions? I didn't see anything else come in, um, but please do get your questions in. Use the GoToWebinar interface, the questions section. You can type in your question there. And, excuse me. I actually, while you were um, talking, I was paying attention, honestly, but I did go and uh, check out that web captioner just to see mm -hmm. um, what it was doing, how it worked. Uh, it's working pretty well. Um, it was catching what you were saying. I was comparing it to what was coming up on on your uh, the PowerPoint. PowerPoint is way more accurate. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but it's not bad. It does only work in Chrome, though. That is something to be where I found out. Um, I default to Firefox as my browser, um, and it said nope. Uh, if you want us to do do another, because it uses Chrome, Google's AI is its 
basis for doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I closed my uh, so I had to pop over to Chrome. <clears throat> so not bad. I'm it's, gonna start yeah, experimenting with it. Yeah, getting I think web capture also has a feature where it will make a transcript for you. So that can it also be useful if it does that. Yeah. There was something about that. I'm gonna see what that looks like afterwards, yeah. Mm-hmm. Ooh. All right, I don't see any other questions, desperate questions coming in right now. Just more thank yous. You're welcome. Um, I think if nobody nobody has any desperate questions they need to ask right now or they want they're thinking of right now, that's okay. Uh, we can wrap things up. No problem. We're almost at our hour. Um, there is Emily's contact information. You can always reach out to her if you do have any questions, comments, thoughts. If you want to discuss with her, uh, her link is there. As she said, the slides will be available along with the recording when we get that put up. And I'm going to show, mm -hmm. show you where that will be. So you'll have access to all of this afterwards um, as well. Um, okay, okay. Question just came out. I'm not sure I understand it. It just says, uh, what is purpose of navigation? Okay, so the purpose of navigation, um, it allows someone to go through a document without the scroll wheel on a mouse or without their trackpad. They can use a keyboard shortcut to go from section to section to section. Um, it helps with that. It also makes a sort an outline of the uh, document on the side of your window so you can go over there and just quick skip to something instead of scrolling that will create a lot of flashing um mm -hmm. so it can be good for physical mobility as well as for on um, very sensitive uh light or people who are very sensitive to light and flashing so okay thank you that explains nice <laughs> thank you they said yes awesome All right, just waiting to see if anything else pops up. Anyone other questions? All right, I am going to um, pull the presenter control back to my screen. So thank you everybody for being here today. Thank you, Emily, for sharing with us uh, your presentation. Um, this is great. Uh, I think lots of awesome information. I've, like I said, I'm already trying out one uh, option for captioning just to see how it works. Um, as I said, we have, unfortunately, with GoToWebinar, it they do not have any built-in live captioning, so we have to use like what you have, you know, something else's. And having a, a, you know, other options are always good too, because you never know what someone's going to use. Um, all right, so this, there we go. So this is our the session page for today's show. Uh, if you go to our main Encompass Live page, and if you just Google or well, use your search engine of choice, Encompass Live is the only thing called this. this we're, our show is the only thing called that on the internet. Uh, so you'll find it right up at the top of your search results. No one else is allowed to use our name. Um, these are upcoming shows, um, but to get our archives, there's a link right here at the bottom. Most recent show is at the top of the page. There's last week's. Um, today's will be here by the end of the day tomorrow. Everything should be processed and ready. There'll be a link to the recording in our YouTube channel and a link to Emily's slides. Everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the recording is available. We also push that information out to our uh, Nebraska Library Commission mailing lists and um, Encompass Live. We have a Facebook page that if you like to use Facebook, you can go over there, pop over there and see, um, here's a reminder to log into today's show, meet the speakers, but then, um, there we go. Here's a recording from last week's so we post over there um, and onto Twitter and Instagram using our hashtag and comp live, a little abbreviation of our name. So if you like to use any of those places, resources, you can go over there and you'll see when the recording's ready, um, or you can just pop back here and look for it. Uh, while we're here, I'll show you, we do have a search feature. If you want to search our archives to see if we've done any a show on any topic you're interested in, you can do so. Uh, you can search the full show archives or just the most recent 12 months. 
That is because this is our full archives going back to when Encompass Life premiered, and I'll show you here. Close your eyes, I'm gonna scroll real fast. Zoom. Okay. January 2009 <laughs> was our first show. So we are in the 15th year, oh my gosh, of Encompass Live, and all of our shows are here. I'm gonna go back up to the top now. Um, so just pay attention to original broadcast dates of anything. Uh, many shows will spend, stand the test of time, still be good, valid, good resources, but some things, uh, information will become old, outdated, links may no longer work anymore, resources may have disappeared, people may work at different libraries from when they presented with us 5, 10, 15 years ago. So just pay attention to that original broadcast date whenever you do watch a recording of one of our shows. Something else I want to um, highlight here before we wrap up is uh, in addition to this weekly show that we host uh, at the Nebraska Library Commission, we also host and run the Big Talk from Small Libraries online conference. This is coming up at the end of the month. It's always the last Friday in February. And it is, um, we do this with the Association for Rural and Small Libraries. All of our speakers are from libraries with an FTE or population served of 10,000 or less. So please do register for it. Our registration is open. The schedule is up. So you can see um, what all of our sessions will be for the day. Our speaker information is all up there as well. So you can see who all of our speakers are. So please do um, register. It's free and open to anybody across the country, uh, across the world, anyone who wants to watch. And so we um, invite you to please do that and spread the word about the conference. Anyone who's interested in what's going on in our small libraries. Please do join us for Big Talk at the end of February. And our next topic for Encompass Live next week will be uh, digital libraries as digital third place, virtual library prog programming. <laughs> um, staff from um, other University of Nebraska uh, uh, locations, uh, Emily's from UNL in Lincoln, uh, but we're having staff from our Kearney and Omaha <laughs> locations uh, come on and talk about virtual library programming. So if you're interested in that, sign up for that or any of our other upcoming shows that we have coming up in the next few months. Other than that, I didn't see any of the new questions coming in while I was doing my wrap up. So I think we are good for today's show. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Emily. Good to see you. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>